What I want to do before we move into our next few guests to play the trailer from a film uh, called The New Barbarianism. Again, it was uh, a film that uh, that um, had uh, an emphasis on talking about uh, civil strife crises, especially uh, with an emphasis on what's happening now in Yemen and the intersection of all of that. And we'll let the film speak for itself in just a moment. We'll be on the phone with Justin Kinney and Stephen Morrison, the co-directors of that film. The war in Syria represents a new low for the international community. We're seeing a war without law, as well as seemingly a war without end. Uh, it's very, very striking that we're living in an age of the bombing of UN convoys, never mind the targeting of hospitals. witnessing a profound surge of violence against civilians, against health workers, patients, facilities, humanitarian convoys across a full spectrum of countries that is really shredding the accountability and protections that are contained in the Geneva Conventions. The attack on Kunduz was a sustained attack over an hour, despite the fact that all the, the parties knew us at our GPS coordinate. We must say that it was our bigger loss in terms of lives. 42 people died, 14 of our staff. This was a tragic mistake. This is a period when there's the danger of vacuum around the world and a danger for the abuse of power by states that are strong enough to do so. The international sense of conscience and consciousness that led to the responsibility to protect uh, in the early 2000s has certainly been eroded. People are struggling to respond. They're building clinics and hospitals and underground bunkers. They're documenting these attacks and publishing them. They're taking measures to the UN Security Council. Stop bombing hospital. Stop bombing health workers. But up to Stop now, these measures have not had much effect in deterring attacks. But many courageous individuals and groups continue the fight. This is a fight that's going to last well into the future. We believe that war stopped at the door of our hospital, and we want to preserve that. And we want to preserve access to health care in, uh, in war zones. We need, that's a battle that's worth to fight. And again, that was uh, the film trailer for an amazing new film called The New Barbarianism. Uh, it's a film that uh, deals with issues, uh, civil strife, the intersections with health policy, uh, st uh, basic uh, adherence to the Geneva Conventions and that say that, that folks who live in, in lands that are affected by uh, tremendous disruption should be entitled to basic rights. We shouldn't be exploiting things like famine on behalf of of trying to advance uh, narrow political means, something that, that really brings up an issue that's of increasingly compelling nature. And uh, I'm going to bring on co-directors of this amazing film uh, one by one here. Uh, Justin Kenny is on the line. Uh, Justin, are you there? Yes, I am. Thanks so much for, for having us. I appreciate it. Well, thanks, and uh, I'll introduce your your uh, collaborator, J. Stephen Morrison, in just a minute, and he has ties to the UW. We'll elaborate on that, but I just want to uh, just bring people up to speed on, uh, on 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 the kind of the greater body of your work. Uh, you work with uh, an organization that you founded called Small Footprint uh, Films, and uh, so the New Barbarianism is is a film that came out about a year ago, and again, you and Stephen will be presenting that film. Uh, here at the uh, University of Wisconsin Madison, so uh, but but it's it's part of a larger body of work to kind of get these subjects of of interest of social justice resident things out into the world. Why why is it important for that kind of independent film work to get out there? Well, I think for many people, it's the only way they're exposed to these issues. I mean, they're not going the the wider audience the wider world isn't going to know about um, these things, particularly in the amount of depth, unless documentarians um, and authors um, investigate, illuminate, and and distribute um, this stuff. I mean, this is a really important thing. And I felt just personally, and one of the reasons why I started Small Footprint Films and why I've been very grateful um, to work with Steve and the rest of the team at CSIS is I think that one of the most important things 
that I can do as a as a professional is to sort of shine a light in places um, where there are issues like this, these serious life and and death issues, and 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 literally the shredding of humanitarian humanitarian norms which were established after World War II. And I think most most of the American public is completely unaware of this. I don't necessarily blame them, um, but I, I think we do have an obligation for those of us who know, for those of us who have storytelling skills, um, to put some skin in the game and to show what's going on. All right, we're going to see if we can bring our, your co-director, uh, Stephen Morrison, in. Uh, so Justin was just explaining uh, just the importance of, of getting independent films like this out there. Uh, and, uh, you know, I was introduced in a little bit of his overall background, but you um, you got your political science direct- doctorate here at the University of Wisconsin. I, I was just in conversation with uh, our former Senator Russ Feingold, who is teaching a class now of international uh, relations students. Uh, th- this connection that Madison uh, you know, has in many different realms, whether it be the students that we send out into the world or the NGOs that are located here. I mean, it's, it's something pretty essential, and I, I, I imagine that's why folks will have an intense interest in the film as you come to town. Does, does that make sense? Yes, it does, and thank you very much. We're really thrilled that this Wednesday, uh, this Wednesday at 4.30 p.m. at the Marquis South in Union South, the Marquis Theater in Union South, we will be screening the film, The New Barbarianism, and uh, Justin and I will be there along with others from the International Division, Guido Podesta, uh, we will uh, have a panel discussion that follows that for an hour involving Heinz Klug from the law faculty, Karen Solheim from the nursing faculty, along with Justin uh, and myself. And we're really honored and thrilled to be able to do that. The film, the central subject of the film is the surge of violence that we're observing across many conflicts that's deliberately targeted violence against the health sector that is, hospitals and clinics, health workers, patients, across a multitude of conflicts. And it was our awareness that that phenomenon had happened slowly over the recent years that drew us to make this film and to try to draw attention to it, try to explain what the root causes are and what the consequences of it are and what can be done diplomatically, operationally, politically, to mitigate this phenomenon, which is a very insidious phenomenon. Your question around UW, I had the honor of working closely with Senator Feingold when he was in the Senate. Um, He, of course, was in the Senate uh, for three terms. In that period, he served as either the uh, chair of the Africa Subcommittee or the ranking minority. I did my degree with the legendary academic Crawford Young in the political science department at UW. I came there with an interest in Africa. Africa has been the central focus of my career. And with Senator Feingold, we interacted in a number of ways. Um, uh, There was a commission that Congress financed that I led back in 2006, reviewing Africa policy. He was on that. We put together in 2001 a a, a CSIS high-level task force on HIV AIDS, originally co-chaired John Kerry and Bill Frist, Senator uh, Feingold came in as the co-chair from 2004 to 2007 with Senator Sununu from New Hampshire. So I have enormous admiration for Senator Feingold and the work that he did. His, his, his time as, as the uh, special envoy in the DRC in the, in the Great Lakes region of Central Africa under uh, President Obama and Secretary Kerry, he, he, he achieved major advances in that period. It's very hard for envoys to do that. He earned the respect of those within the region, and we're in his debt for that work. There are other prominent Wisconsinites who are playing major roles. Of course, Tommy Thompson, former governor, former secretary of health human services under George W. Bush, has just published his memoir, was a critically important figure on the HIV, the global HIV response. Yeah. Mark Green, who graduated from the law school and the undergraduate at UW, is currently the head of the U.S. Agency for International Development and doing a sterling job there. His chief of staff is Bill Steiger. Uh, Bill Steiger's father was a prominent politician who died a tragically young death. Uh, From Wisconsin, Bill Steiger did his Ph.D. at the University of Wisconsin. He is chief of staff to Mark Green at U.S. Agency for International Development. 
Uh, John Lang uh, uh, graduated from the law school, went on to a very distinguished career leading the charge on on Africa, on health, on pandemic flu response. So there are many, many prominent individuals who had huge impact, who began their careers in training at the University of Wisconsin. Thank John, you. And John Lang was our speaker for the United Nations Association this past May, and then and then, uh, about a year earlier, too, he works with the United Nations Foundation, so it works very closely with that organization that we alluded to earlier, where Russ will be speaking on October 28th. But but again, I want to punctuate uh, throughout this half hour uh, the, the two opportunities folks will have to hear hear uh, you, Stephen, and, and Justin. Um, uh, we mentioned, and we will come back to that in just a second, this event happening at 4.30 on Wednesday at Union South in the Marquee Theater, uh, a screening of the film followed by by um, a chance to be in dialogue with you both. But Justin, you're also doing a lecture on Tuesday night at 6, I believe, at the Memorial Union here on campus. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Correct. Yes, um, I'm going to be delivering a lecture um, the title of the lecture is called The Cost of Not Being There, What Happens When no- Wars Are No Longer Covered. Um, this, this lecture stems from my, my growing concern that we're seeing much less um, conflict and war coverage um, in the mainstream American media. And there, there are various reasons for that. Our co- global conflicts are protracted. Um, there's increasing dangerous to journalists covering wars it's much more dangerous even in the past 10 years it's become much more dangerous to cover conflict there are budget constraints and at times there's there's an apathetic public and i I think all of these things add up to a very disturbing trend in in basically we're we're ending up with a public which is much 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 less aware of, of what's going on in the world in a time where we really need to know more about what's going on in the world uh, so we're going to be talking about that. Um, we're going to be unpacking the issue, and uh, I'll also be proposing um, some hopefully common sense, real world um, solutions. And hopefully, some media organizations will at least a- engage with those ideas. So you know, as often happens in a powerful hour long documentary film, where, where things the information is so densely packed. We, we go into this with some really horrific situations, uh, bombings of hospitals, uh, the, the, the specter of famine potentially being used against the people of, of Yemen by, uh, by, by Saudi uh, powers that be, uh, uh, and, and how this impacts with individuals. And, and you all were, were privileged, I think, to, to, to have a chance to really get behind the scenes and see things from on the ground from all of these perspectives. But I, I'm also encouraged by the fact that you wind around with um, – with uh, some of the things that have happened uh, at the level of the UN, uh, new policy changes, new debates, uh, you know, uh, are, you know, I guess a real uh, reemergence of a devotion to the Geneva Convention, saying that atrocities like this shouldn't happen. People shouldn't um, have their health and and and, uh, and and very lives endangered by conflicts like this. Um, so, so Stephen, let me start with you, and then we'll go to Justin. You see, so, so again, you know, thinking about the arc of the film, um, how do you encompass both the horrific nature of, of of a situation like this, but also bring out the the strengths of the people involved and the hope that we have that we can undo these horrific situations? Well, I think the one of the um, most valuable and brilliant innovations of this film is what Justin was able to do, which was, you know, we wanted to bring home the reality at the ground level of what it means to be living in a situation where you are attempting to deliver health and humanitarian assistance and you are becoming the target of concentrated violence because of what you do in, in gross violation of the Geneva Conventions with flagrant disregard of international norms under international humanitarian law. And what we were able to do, thanks to the ingenuity that Justin brought to the making of this film, was to have three segments um, that, that, that achieved that ground-level insight. And the, those were in Turkey and Syria, they were in Yemen, and they were in Afghanistan. And I think that provides a very powerful vivid force. The other thing I want to emphasize is the remarkable openness that a very diverse group of high-level opinion leaders had towards us in making 
this film, the willingness to trust us and to come on camera. We open and close with Senator McCain. We have Joanne Liu, the uh, president of the international section of the Doctors Without Borders, MSF. We have uh, over 30 people um, in the film um, who came on to talk to us about this problem from different vantage points. And that gives it a reality and a freshness, too, um, when, when you can hear from the policymakers and you can hear from the operators. Um, you can hear from Zahir Salul, who founded the Syrian American Medical Society, talking about how they went about hardening up their structures underground and in mountainsides and the like in order to continue to deliver services. So we were very, we were very fortunate that our friends, many of these people are our friends or our associates professionally, saw, shared with us the view that this was a really important, powerful, and timely topic, and it was one that needed to be presented in a quite powerful and, and coherent way. And I, and so without those people coming on board, we would have been in a much, much weaker position without being able to use the kind of insights and, and, and access that Justin brought to us to get to Yemen and to Syria, Turkey, and to Afghanistan. We wouldn't have had all of those stories woven in. So that was the, in my mind, those, that's the secret to the sauce of what we were able to do. Well, Stephen, Thank let you. me stay with you for just a minute, and we'll bring Justin in. Uh, but but I, I did want to uh, focus in on, on, on the powerful appearance by, by Senator McCain, who, of course, we are, are thinking of uh, his, his memorial having been so recent. Um, but but I think of the way he closed out the film. Uh, we were talking about the aftermath of uh, uh, an American gunship firing on a hospital and uh, the horrific uh, consequences of that, and him talking about um, accountability within the military. Now he, you know, he he noted uh, you know that folks were demoted, that they were um, they were disciplined for for their role, but he also noted that the higher ups weren't necessarily accountable for this. So kind of the the, the, the trademark candor that he brought to this situation. But can you reflect on? Having someone like that um, in a position of power that um, that's not just an apologist, but is actually holding people accountable. Well, I think that um, our military, as we try to show in the course of this film, our military made a terrible set of mistakes during the uh, the bombing of the hospital, the MSF hospital in fall '15 in northern Afghanistan. I'm sorry, but I was our systems guessing. were functional. But our fi systems were functional within our military in terms of oversight, investigation, and accountability. Um, I think Senator McCain's point is it should have gone farther in terms of accountability, higher up the chain. And having that voice coming from the chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee is vitally important. Um, I think we are trying to make the point that Congress, whether you're talking about Yemen or Syria um, or Afghanistan and tragedies involving our own militaries, that Congress is vitally important in, in setting the parameters and the expectations and the like. And frankly, we have seen more and more interest in the, you know, every year there's the defense, uh, uh, the National Defense Authorization Act the NDAA, in which Congress uh, applies certain conditions and instructions to the administration on critical matters. This is a very powerful instrument that Congress has, and it's one that's been used the last several years to pursue the very issues that we have laid out in this film, to bring about greater accountability and greater self-scrutiny by our own military about are we doing the maximum to uh, ensure that civilian casualties are kept to a minimum in conflict zones. Um, how do we, <clears throat> how do we uh, proceed in investigating incidents of this kind? So I'm actually encouraged. I'm not, I don't think this film is meant to leave us in a despondent or, or pessimistic view about the U.S. military per se. It can always do better, as Senator McCain has indicated, but it is, it acquitted itself. It distinguished itself in general. It has set the standards globally around accountability and adherence to the international humanitarian law. Not always. There are periods when there are 
controversies and mistakes, um, but we are not locked into. We are not Russia. Uh, we are not Saudi Arabia. We face serious problems in how we structure our relationship, our affiliation, our military alliance with Saudi Arabia, and that's an issue we tried to get out in the film as a major source of problem problems as well. Thank you. And, and Justin, uh, uh, one of the things we talked about last night is your challenge as an independent filmmaker working on the ground to, uh, to develop relationships of trust. And of course, when you're working in a place like uh, Yemen or Afghanistan or some of the other places the film was made, um, these are people who maybe uh, aren't necessarily um, particularly inclined to be friendly toward Americans, uh, given the nature of, of our foreign policy. And, and but, uh, but on the other hand, it seems like people showed enormous generosity in terms of sharing their stories, talking about very, very difficult things. So, so you know, what, what, what is your role in terms of... Uh, 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 being a filmmaker, uh, before you can start the camera rolling, to actually engender a relationship of trust with the people whose lives you're covering? You know, a lot of how, you know, we go about doing these types of things is just, is based on relationships. And oftentimes it's a friend of a friend of a friend, uh, a former colleague of somebody else. And that's kind of how we, you know, we're able to sort of verify each other's credentials. Um, a mutual friend or mutual acquaintance, professional acquaintance, will say, you know, this person in Syria, I've worked with them, I trust them, I'm going to introduce you to Justin. Um, he's an American journalist, and and I, I trust him. And, and that's how the, sort of the foundation starts. It's usually through a mutual party that makes the introduction, and then you, you build up from there. Um, unfortunately, you know, this is going to be one of the topics in my lecture. It's so difficult to get footage out of Syria. I mean, it, it really, really is, particularly not just the immediate aftermath of attacks or attacks while they're happening, but actually sort of documentary quality um, footage. So I was very, very fortunate um, to work with some folks in the Aleppo Media Center, um, some of the same folks who were involved um, with The Last Men in Aleppo, which was nominated for an Oscar. Um, to work with them, you know, Steve and I decided that we morally and we weren't in a position where we could say because the situation was particularly bad in Aleppo, and that's around the time we were working with them when when Assad's forces was flush were were flushing out that city. We didn't feel comfortable saying we want you to go to this hospital on this day. We 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 just didn't think that was appropriate. Um, fortunately for us. They had some amazing footage, which is featured throughout the film, drone footage, which which really starkly shows the level of destruction um, that has occurred there. And, and I think it just seeing those images really resonates with the viewer in a way that a lot of the other footage hasn't. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the, the other footage starts to look the same, and people just tend to glaze over. Um, and then we were able to get some trust of some Syrian doctors who came on camera and, and, and told their stories. And I think that's an incredibly important part of unpacking any type of international issue is to sort of get on the ground level and have our viewers look in the eyes of a fellow human being. And I think sometimes that gets lost. Um, in the case of Yemen, uh, we, it was incredibly complicated. Uh, very difficult. Most journalists don't go in there. I think the year that we did get in there, I think it was just us in front line in terms of American media that actually got into the city of Sana. And I worked my contacts very hard and we found some underemployed uh, filmmakers on the ground in Yemen. Um, and we worked with them in the International Medical Corps over the period of about two months. And in that situation, we had to go through a very rigorous a clearing process. We had to, with the IMC, we had to negotiate access through various um, factions um, throughout the city to secure uh, safe travel, and, and we were able to pull that off. And again, I think that kind of demonstrated when when you look at the aid workers and the patients in Yemen, it's it's not just the news headline. We we sort of reveal who these people are, and I think that that's hits home. And I I think. You know, we need to see much more of that um, because I think that's something that's being lost in a lot of t today's news is this sort of connectedness to our, to our common humanity. And, and I think that 
having a camera, you know, and, and revealing these people as actual individuals, not just a 30 second sound bite that is essential. Well, maybe we can close out the hour. Just, just some examples of some of the folks that you met uh, in the hospital, uh, people who, who you know, who did face the consequences of this. We want to just pivot for just a minute, though, back to Stephen. Uh, you, you know, throughout the documentary, um, the folks, uh, the courageous folks who works for the organization MSF, Médecins Sans Frontières, which is uh, for doctors uh, without borders, um, um, you know, come forward again and again. Uh, very often, they're in the midst of these situations. Um, they, they lost folks but, uh, but they uh, they too um, you know like you they need to both engage uh, thoroughly in this subject and examine it uh, examine the human dimensions of it but also be at a distance uh, from it as well in fact because of the if they are in the middle of it as, as some of them describe in the film uh, but could you talk about again uh, those doctors and those other foreign aid people uh, providers uh, that that uh, that do plunge into these situations and, and what drives them and what what do you learn from them, Stephen? Well, I think first thing to keep in mind is that they are remarkably courageous and committed, and they live with extraordinary dangers, and they get up every day and go back to work um, in the most extraordinarily dangerous settings. And that alone is is reason, I think, that we cannot give up hope. Um, And that's a point we're trying to make here in this film is that this is a tough set of issues, uh, but we cannot simply uh, become despondent and pessimistic and hopeless. We need to remain hopeful. Um, There are certain challenges in what do you do? Um, The UN Security Council Uh, two and a half years ago, passed a resolution 2286 reaffirming international humanitarian law and the obligations of states um, by a unanimous vote. Okay, so there was high diplomacy and a major mobilization. It has not had any any impact, noticeable, concrete or material impact on the behavior of the Russians or the Assad regime in Syria or the Saudi behavior. Um, in, um, in, in Yemen, but it's a form of high diplomacy, very important. Collection of data is very important. We need to have standardized ability to put on the board exactly where these attacks are happening, with what regularity and what consequences. We've had some improvements in the collection of data. Physicians for Human Rights, uh, the Coalition uh, Against uh, uh, Conflict in Health, uh, is has put out annual studies that are uh, remarkable and very powerful. The UN is moving ahead in trying to document and put up uh, global data on this. That's been a perennial problem. Operationally, the people that are working at the front lines, MSF, the International Committee of the Red Cross, International Medical Corps, and many others, along with all of their national partners in the uh, Red Cross, Red Crescent societies, and other civil organizations, they are innovating, they're trying their best in order to harden up their facilities, to document for purposes of future accountability, to make use better use of technology that allows them to communicate from afar with remote technical expertise. There's a lot of innovation, there's a lot of not giving up and attempting to figure out ways around this. Um, but it, it's very hard when you're up against a foe like or the Russians or you're up against the Saudi Air Force or you're up against an Assad regime which is prepared to sacrifice half of the population, half of its urban centers for the sake of survival. Um, we need to stay with this effort. We need to improve the, the behavior and practices and internal doctrines of militaries. We need to look at our relationships with our partners like the Saudi, our security relationships, and not forgive these excesses, but rather uh, make sure they do not happen. We're not doing very well in many of these regards, but there's a lot more space for improvement if there is high-level political will. And we don't always have that high-level political will coming from the, from, from the statesmen and stateswomen in key countries. Just want to emphasize for those of you who are joining in midstream, uh, the, the two opportunities to hear our two guests, Stephen Morrison, 
uh, who is uh, who earned his doctorate uh, in, in political science here at the University of Wisconsin Madison, and uh, filmmaker Justin Denny. Uh, Justin is speaking uh, first on Tuesday night at six o'clock at the Memorial Union, and then uh, uh, the, a screening of the film *The New Barbarianism* uh, will occur at four thirty in the Marquee Theater at Union South. Uh, following the film, both uh, of the directors will be available to uh, to interact with you as an audience. So we hope you can come out to those those audiences. We're right about the six minute warning here, so I'll ask you guys maybe just to we'll, we'll concentrate on uh, on, on, uh, on more more succinct answers. <laughs> and uh, again, we encourage folks to come out and be in that further interaction with you. But 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 Stephen, I guess I guess uh, and Justin, I'll, I'll give you a last word in a few minutes here. But um, but it just as you're talking about these things, these are essentially modern examples of genocide. They're they're reminiscent of, of things that the world saw um, a couple of generations ago playing out in, in different theaters in the world. Uh, are there lessons that we can learn from history about what our response needs to be and how we need to rise up as a global community in the face of this kind of thing? Well, they, there are different definitions. There are definitions of different categories of crimes um, under the conventions um, there's, you know, crimes of war, crimes against humanity, there's genocide. In all of these cases, what we need is the evidentiary base collected, and I think there's quite a bit of activism, particularly on the Syria case, in building the documentary base for future for future prosecution and accountability. And um, accountability, we can never lose sight of how central the ultimate accountability is uh, for these cases um, in order to deter fu- the future. But we can't be naive. Um, uh, deterring these cases is proving to be very difficult, but we cannot allow the International Criminal Court to be destroyed or marginalized, as has been suggested by um, our current National Security Advisor, uh, John Bolton, who has condemned it and sought to dismantle it. And we cannot... Uh, turn our backs away from supporting kind of investigations. I just want to thank you for helping us this morning get our story out and to advertise Justin's lecture tomorrow evening at the Memorial Union and then the screening on Wednesday at the Marquee Theater in Union South, 4.30 to 5.30. It's free of charge. And the panel that follows for 45 minutes with Justin, myself, Heinz Klug from the law faculty, Karen Solheim, from the Global Health Institute. It should be a wonderful discussion in a, of the way forward and an opportunity to hear from the audience members. And I hope many of your listeners will be able to join us. And thank you so much for taking time to give us the opportunities to speak with you and your audience this morning. Well, and Stephen, welcome back to Madison. I know you, you, you travel here frequently, but it's, it's great to have you and have had that work you're doing out of the world. Justin, we're going to give you the, in our final couple minutes here, just a last word, but but um, again, you know, as an independent filmmaker, why, how would your best hopes be realized in terms of what audiences will take out of this? Not just to be obviously um, be burdened by this, be concerned about it, but actually something they might be able to do um, to to affect change in the world. Whether it's contacting their Congress people or encouraging more engagement and issues like this in the United Nations or or, um, you know, other means of spreading the word among their neighbors. I mean, just getting this out there so it's not hidden under a bushel. Yeah, uh, that's a, I mean, it's a great question. I mean, one of the things that, that I try to do in, in all my work, and not, not just the work that I do with Steve, is to try to give all of us some sort of sense of shared accountability, that these things are not just happening in a vacuum, and, and that we all need to be aware of this, and to be doing something about it. Uh, you know, unfortunately, this film came out just over a year ago. Steve and I had the premiere in September of 2017. And this issue is certainly not going away. I mean, we've already had more than 150 attacks in Syria alone through June of this year. Um, and the death toll through June of this year, according to the World Health Organization, on every tax against healthcare globally had already exceeded the deaths of the previous year. We've already had more than a couple of hundred um, individuals killed this year. And, and this is, is something that I think that as, as a 
community of Americans and, and, and even the broader international community. This is something we have to take on. Um, this is, it's kind of interesting. I, I'm doing another documentary about um, a Holocaust case in Ukraine, um, and I've been working closely with a French Catholic priest, um, Patrick Dubois. And just to give you a short story, he's been investigating Holocaust crimes for the past 10 years in the former Soviet Union. But I was sitting with him in his office a few months ago, and one of the things that he says is nobody wants to stop a genocide or another atrocity when it's happening. We want to hold a memorial event 20 years after the fact. And I think it's our obligation to put this out in front of people to make sure that we're not doing that, that we are saying we know about this now and we're going to do something about it. Yeah. And voting is a big part of it. Calling yeah. your, your, you know, your congressperson is a big part of it. And just keeping an eye on things and telling your neighbors, telling your friends, telling your families. Um, because I do think most people, if they actually know about this, they are affected by this. I mean, Steve and I can, can tell you about hun literally hundreds of people have come up to us after screening events and saying they had no idea and they want to know what they can do to help. Uh, so I think there's, there's plenty of opportunity. And, and I don't think what Steve and I will show this film anywhere and we'll talk to anybody yeah. about it. And I think one of the reasons why we're so passionate about it is, is not just for the victims, but also for, for our friends who are literally on the ground in these war zones fighting day in and day out. And it's our responsibility. It's the least we can do for them. All right. Well, again, we're out of time now, but thank you so much to both of you. Justin Denny will be speaking at 6 o'clock at the Memorial Union uh, on Tuesday night. Uh, and Thanks talking so about you very welcome. Thank you so much to you both. And then uh, both Justin and Stephen uh, will be presenting their film, The New Barbarianism, 430 at the Marquis Theater Union South uh, coming up on Wednesday with, a, with a, a presentation afterwards. Thank you both so much. We'll hope to have you back on again. But we encourage folks to get out there to, uh, to meet you and to be a part of this important work. This has been Community Conversations here on the Sun, 103.5 FM. I'm John Quinlan. Uh, looking forward to having you join us from 7 to 9 a.m. next week. Have a great week.